Good audience. Yeah. yeah. Right. I was wondering this room was like <laughs> <laughs> six people. Right. Let's get started. Welcome, everybody. This is a digital storytelling panel. Um, if this is not the right place, just stay where you are. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Grace Loom, and um, I was an adjunct here um, many years ago, and I uh, now teach a class for a um, universal studies program that produces the humans of Oshkosh. My background is mostly in print journalism, for, you know, working in Rhino Hill, um, Austin American Statesman, People Magazine, and one year um, where I called um, Grace Brown Wild Journalistically, I yeah. worked for Star Magazine. <laughs> okay. um, you know, I'm going to have the other panelists um, introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about the earliest technology they ever used. I want to tell you that in high school, I used a IBM Selectric using whiteout and a real dictionary. Okay, that's my first technology, and I'll, I'll hand it over to um, Brad. My name's Brad Zbung, uh, class of '99. Um, my first technology was probably, I think my dad had like a Tandy word processor that <laughs> he probably got, he probably, it was probably secondhand, he probably didn't even get it straight from Radio Shack, but like from somebody who bought it at Radio Shack and then sold it because it was outdated. Then it became, it came to our house. Uh, I did not do much with it other than uh, uh, wish that it could play Atari 2600 games. <laughs> <laughs> and during, you know, after graduation from here, Sure. So uh, my I, after graduating in 99, I moved to Chicago, where I've been ever since. Um, my first job out of college was in the PR department for Leo Burnett, an ad agency there. We did PR for Burnett, uh, and as opposed to like their clients. Um, I was there for five years, and then I, at that time, I started um, what was at the time a print publication called The Heckler, which was and still is satirical. We focus just on the Chicago Cubs, which I know is not super popular around here. <laughs> when I grew up, the the Brewers were in the American League and the Cubs were in the National League. So my little like, you know, junior high fantasy was that they'd meet up in the World Series. Thankfully, that never happened. And then the Brewers made the jump to the National League. I moved to Chicago, still a Brewers fan, but then I lived <clears throat> for like six years, five blocks from Wrigley Field, and kind of got pulled into all of that, sort of like a cult. Um, and then I definitely have given up most of my Wisconsin uh, sports roots. But anyway, um, we, we, yeah, we connected um, with an audience by doing this kind of like satirical publication about the Cubs, because at that point, everything was like super serious. And it was before, you know, like we, we had a website before the term like was blog was even a thing. So, um, it, it, it's morphed over years. It's always been a side hustle for us, but we there's a handful of us who are still really passionate about it. And when we have time to devote to it, we do. And uh, we've kind of branched out into doing other sports and teams, and we do uh, trips and events um, and, and uh, you know things like that. We have a decent social presence. It's never big enough, as everyone on this panel and everyone in here can, can attest. Um, but uh, that's a, no matter what my career has been, my nine to five, my passion has always been uh, with trying to connect with people in kind of a lighthearted uh, fashion around sports. Awesome. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Patrick Stigman. I'm the Vice President and Editorial Director for Global Digital Content at ESPN, based, based in scenic Bristol, Connecticut. Um, I've been there just about 15 years. Um, had a number of roles from executive editor to editor-in-chief of ESPN.com US to editorial um, director for print and digital media in the US. And now about two and a half years ago, expanded my role to have oversight of all of our digital assets around the world, which now include 14 editions of ESPN.com around the planet um, and growing. Uh, I also have a Tandy story, but it's the, you know, no one, no one in here has ever heard of it, will ever see it, but go look it up on eBay because I'm sure I could get a lot of money for this because I have it down in my basement. It was called a TRS-80, Trash-80, as I like to call it. It is a, a one of the first laptops that you could ever use. Literally would go cover a high school basketball games. Um, uh, and it was so awesome because after the game, you would, could write on this computer, would hold something like, I don't know, six or 800 characters um, and the huge memory. And you'd have to like, uh, you know, write four paragraphs and then send that in and then write four more paragraphs to send it in because it didn't have memory to hold more than that. 
But the best part was, is the way you connected was through these acoustic couplers that you would literally take a phone, push it. If you remember, you know, phones that actually were like not had a dial tone. You know, had, it actually had a handset and not this. Um, and you plug it into this thing. You make this obnoxious noise uh, tone. You plug it in there and hope it would connect. And I remember one night it was Prairie du Chien High School. Everyone had left the game. I had covered a Cuba City Prairie du Chien basketball game, and I was in the principal's office trying to get my Trash 80 to connect, and it wouldn't connect. I had to send my story back to the State Journal at the time. Had to send it. Wouldn't work. So I packed up my stuff, started walking down the street, trying to find a house with lights on. <laughs> Knocked on the door. This kindly old woman came to the door, and I wasn't trying to explain to her. I'm a reporter for the Wisconsin State Journal who just covered a basketball game. I need to use their phone so I can transmit my story through acoustic couplers back to the office. I'm pretty sure the cops were coming at any moment, uh, but God love her. She was nice enough to let me in. I finished my story, connected it, and it was in the paper the next day. So uh, to now be in charge of a global uh, a digital product that instantaneously serves content around the world feels like a bit of evolution for me, so I'm happy to be here. <laughs> I'm Mariah Haberman. I am the director of Discover Wisconsin. I just oversee the brand. It's a video-based uh, brand that covers mostly tourism. It's a TV show, and also we're on Roku and uh, online at discoverwisconsin.com, YouTube, all the rest. Earliest technology for me, so I was a 90s kid, uh, so for me it'd probably be like a GigaPet. Did anyone have a GigaPet? <laughs> Those things that you brought to classrooms and you could like, it's kind of the first form of texting, I think, because you could communicate with your friends and teachers hated it. Um, and I do remember checking out a book in third grade at the library called Windows 98 for Dummies that I brought <laughs> uh, I was an early adopter. So, uh, yeah, I'm super excited to be here in terms of my at what I did or when I graduated and what I did afterwards. I graduated from UW Oshkosh in 2010 with a degree in journalism, advertising PR, and uh, it was 2010, so there weren't a lot of jobs for PR majors back then or PR grads. So I took a gig for $10 an hour in downtown Chicago, which economically was a terrible decision. Uh, but it did get me in the door as a consultant back in Madison. Uh, I just worked for a bunch of realtors, which again was was literally a Craigslist job, <laughs> which then got me at an agency in Madison called Heaving, which is the largest marketing firm in downtown Madison. And uh, from from Heaving, I Facebook messaged a guy I kind of sort of knew to see if they would entertain the thought of uh, an audition with me because I really wanted to do more on-camera work and kept in touch with them for a year and a half until they finally said, sure, come on in. And I've been at Discover for five and a half years. Um, Lloyd Olson, uh, class of 1994. Um, and my earliest technology, I was really an early adopter, but that was because um, uh, my neighbor was an architect of supercomputers. And so we would always have the latest and greatest. But since I'll just, I'll kind of throw it out. Right after college, um, I left and started working in politics, doing campaigns. And um, I had a MacBook that we had to plug in, but I remember audio decouplers, but we had to plug in. And we, so um, I figured out on the 92 Clinton campaign how to mail merge the media list in um, <laughs> that old, um, database program that nobody uses anymore with the press release and press send and leave and go have dinner for two and a half hours while all the press oh releases sent one by one on the hotel phone. <laughs> so, um, so it wasn't fax. Uh, yeah, it was. It was e-fax. Oh, so perfect. there you go. Wow. Um, and that made me brilliant from the communication standpoint <laughs> campaign world. Um, and I, I guess the best way to sum up is I spent five, six years there, and then um, retired from campaigns in 1998, and a buddy of mine looked at me and said, I own a URL called mnpolitics.com, and I'm based in Minnesota. He said, do you want to do something with it? And since then, um, I've built two, built and sold two agencies and built and sold two or three media properties um, in and around public affairs, business, healthcare, and ag. Um, and so if the heckler is <laughs> Chicago satire, we are the opposite of satire in Minneapolis <laughs> on um, politics, <clears throat> business, um, and healthcare and agriculture to this day. And we have a series of 
newsletters that hit 25,000 opinion leaders every day called takes. Awesome. Okay, so this you know this panel is about digital storytelling, and at the heart of all, all, all you know, the fact that it's digital does not make that make it any less that you're storytellers. Okay, so I want to ask the panel, uh, the panelists, how has the aspect of, of the digital aspect changed the way you tell stories? I went off last. <laughs> so it's changed everything as it relates to um, what I do and I think what ESPN does for large in the sense that uh, we no longer consider uh, any of our content elements or shows or content creations as being part of specific platforms because every single thing that ESPN creates can be consumed on this device real time. Whether that is audio live stream of Sarah Spain on ESPN Chicago. That's my wife. Um, <laughs> or if it's watching SportsCenter or, or a live game on your phone. If it's a real-time statistics and data. If it's an uh, uh, analysis or feature story that we're featuring on a particular sport or topic. Um, if it's a edition of ESPN the magazine, which you can read before it actually ever publish, is published or lands on your doorstep or on the newsstand. You can read it on your phone. And this is now global. So all 14 editions of our international um, platform have apps. And it's all, in fact, it's all the same app. All you literally do in the app is change edition. And it's all funneled in the same way. So we no longer consider it television and radio and audio and print and digital. It's all digital. You may choose to consume some of it on a particular device. Maybe it's a 50-inch flat screen. Maybe it's reading in the pages of ESN Magazine or listening to audio or podcast in your car, but it's all digital. And that was a mindset shift within the company that said we have to be more efficient and we have to make sure that, and I hate to say this as a journalist, to use things like content and assets, but they, they really are. A piece of content is an asset. It could be a, a, a column. It could be a feature story. It could be um, breaking news. It could be a, a full-length game. It could be a 30 for 30 film, but it's an asset. And we have to make sure that can all be distributed immediately around the world to serve fans. Uh, ESPN has a very simple mission statement. Serve sports fans anytime, anywhere. And what digital has allowed us to do is actually live up to that promise. Because you can be on your cell phone watching a cricket match in Mumbai, or you could be um, in the middle of the Saharan desert following uh, South Africa uh, rugby, or you could be following the NBA in, in Shanghai, and you can all get it on your phone. And to me, that is the heart of how we deliver content. And digital is the connective tissue that gets us there. I would add that I think digital storytelling has held us all a lot more accountable. I think um, on the TV side of Discover Wisconsin, and we too think of it as all one now, not just separate. Um, kind of entities, but when in the old days you could you could distribute something out to TV, you know it would get views because there wasn't nearly as much competition and you didn't get a lot of feedback. With with uh, digital, you do get feedback immediately, and I find our producers asking themselves a lot more, which is a question they always should have asked themselves, but asking why would the viewer, why would our audience really care about this? Because if they don't care about it, the numbers are going to show up on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, Snapchat, all the rest. Um, so I do think that that's one of the big things is it's held us so much more accountable to make sure we're giving the audience something that's going to enrich them or, or you know, something that's going to make them watch for the next 30 seconds and the next 30 seconds after that because we don't have the luxury anymore of them sitting through a 30-minute TV show. That's just not the way it works. So my practice, if you call it that, is much more of a hybrid. We're about a third of a media company and two-thirds consulting, PR, reputation management. And as that's evolved um, over the last 20 years, we started our first e-newsletter blog before they were called blogs was well-designed HTML with color pictures and everything. <laughs> but we had to actually print it out to give it to legislators and other reporters because legislators still had DOS email. <laughs> and so we literally have to drop it on their desk. Everyone um, over the age of like 45. goes, DOS? What's yeah, DOS? Um, and this is like 1998. So 
technically it's not that long ago. Right. Um, <laughs> plain text. Um, and so the interesting thing is we, we became really known for good insight and good analysis, specifically around public affairs issues in the Midwest during that time. And then fast forward, we sold that, merged it, got rid of it. Um, and ten, eight years ago, I started the next one, which is black and white, well-organized links um, that uh, the busy executive can read on their phone as quickly as possible. And so the irony that we went from fancy graphics in digital in 1998 to no graphics in now was all about this and time. Because we saw the fact that our audience used to spend 35 to 40 minutes with us, and now they will spend three to four minutes with us. It's just up. different. I, I get it. No, I, I get different that. can be depressing. <laughs> <laughs> so, you want to answer? Um, in, 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 in this really crowded landscape of, of, of digital offerings, okay, how do, how do you make your stories stand out? Oh, you, I mean, you have a, I mean, is it because you have a very specific audience? That helps. Um, you have like a second to connect with someone now. Back in the day when we, you know, I'm going to sound maybe the, hopefully the youngest person to ever shout, like, get off my lawn. But like back in the day, when we had a print piece, you know, we'd hand it out to people and like they'd pick it up places and they actually had like time, you know, they'd like read it in the, in the bleachers before a game or they, you know, read it at a, at a bar or whatever. And now it's like, if you don't connect with somebody in like a, like half a second, it's whatever you have produced is going to fall on deaf ears. And if you do connect with them, you can you know you see it mushroom. Like we used to, our print piece used to be at its at its height, probably like fifty thousand copies every run. And then uh, you know that just was extremely time and labor intensive and very expensive. And now like I can post something that connects with people. It might it's not a story as much as like a vibe kind of and and that can you know we posted something last night after the astros got eliminated from the playoffs because last year or the spring someone from the astros said we're not the cubs we're not basically we're not going to flame out after winning we're, we're a good team and so then all the you know cubs fans had a chip on their shoulder about that astros got eliminated in five games just like the cubs did last year we posted a meme like of just one image and it, it's so far got like fifty thousand views on, on facebook so it's like that that would have taken me a month and a half and like fifteen thousand dollars if I was doing that as a print piece to have that kind of reach. But uh, I don't remember your question. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just ranting now. <laughs> but it's just it's just it's it's just completely different and you have you have practically no time to make that connection with someone now. I, I would say that there's a blessing and a curse, right? In in one sense there's so many different ways to reach people whether it's through any social channels, it's through, in, in the case of ESPN, um, you know, social outlets in each of our editions, obviously our global uh, edition for ESPN on handle on Twitter or Facebook or some of the most followed uh, sports handles in the world. Um, but you also have, you know, multiple platforms for us to, to reach people. But at the end of the day, on this device, it, people are coming to the home screen. They're not clicking to the NFL section, they're not going to the MLB section, they're not going to the commentary section. They're going to the home screen and they're scrolling maybe three scrolls at a given time. So you can't beat them in real estate. We have infinite space on digital to post content, but we do not have infinite real estate to highlight content. So you have to be creative. Well, first of all, the good news is while people spend fewer, a, a less amount of time per visit, they're coming more often. So you may have multiple bites of the apple during the course of a day. We have, you know, uh, a quarter of our audience comes back every day on ESPN Digital, which on one hand you say, well, that means three quarters of the people don't. But the flip side is that's a massive increase over what it was even four or five years ago. Um, people, the, the, the metric that we care most about is engagement. It's not visits. It's not page views. It's time spent because the more time you spend with us, the more likely you are to uh, first one, be a, a, a good customer for our advertising business, but also means you're more likely to engage and want to discover more content and come back more often. So one of the things we do very aggressively, in addition to, to distributing our content through every available channel, is to recirculate content. Um, you know, 
going back to my old, you know, really old, long ago newspaper days, um, I call myself a recovery newspaper editor. Um, <laughs> You would never take a story that was in Sunday's paper and republish it on Monday or in Monday's paper and do it on Thursday. We do that all the time on digital. So obviously some content is perishable, you know, real time live game data, news results, things like that come and go very quickly. But there's other elements, particularly investigative stories, enterprise content, feature content, analysis that actually has a shelf life. But it only has that shelf life if you keep bringing it back in front of people. Um, so we, and, and through our personalization engine, if you've seen story once, you're not going to see it again, even if I've repositioned it on the homepage of ESPN's app. But if you haven't seen it, when you were there at, at six in the morning or noon or 8 p.m., I may show it to you again at midnight. And we can track the data to see how users are able to consume that content. So you, opportunity to recirculate content, get it back in front of people. And I'll just give you one quick example. Um, we had a writer covered the last Cricket World Cup. Um, and, you know, part of my global uh, learnings is learning the sport of cricket. And we had uh, Ray Thompson, one of our absolutely most talented, I would argue one of the most talented sports writers, writers period, in journalism, go write what was about a 10,000 word story about uh, why cricket matters. And first of all, substantial consumption of that story, even though it was long, and people say, you won't read on digital. If it's compelling, they will, but you got to hook them. They'll look past it, but if you hook them and it's compelling, they'll stay with you. That story posted about six weeks later, we saw this massive traffic spike in that particular story. Like, what, what is going on? The Cricket World Cup is over. It was six weeks ago. Why would this story get relifted? Well, one of the most influential social media leads in India came across the story and resent it out, tweeted it out, and shared it on his social posts. And it got, he had, I don't know, three, four million followers. And that got re-energized and it got recirculated through the system without us even trying to do it again. So one of the, the lessons there is to say, make sure you're getting content in front of people, stuff that you care about, that has legs, as we like to say, as often as possible. And then also take advantage of every distribution channel you can to amplify it. I want Mariah to answer that question regarding how to get it, and then I have a question for Boris. Okay. Uh, for, I mean, as far as how to break through the clutter, I think this is very vague advice, but you just have to be really, really good at a lot of different things. I think I'm a big believer in that excellence is in the details. And when I have someone who wrote an article or produced a video that was wonderful and get frustrated because it didn't get the eyeballs, I'll ask, how many times did you write that headline? Because a lot of times... I'll have a social media person say, oh, here's the caption. I First of all, I never use the word caption on social media because it's a light word, and to me, it's a headline. You're always writing a headline. And I'll ask our people, we, I want you to write 15 versions of that headline so we can kind of do mini focus groups and figure out what's going to res resonate without doing clickbait, figure out exactly what that image is like because the image that, I mean, these are all like very kind of, um, they feel like unimportant things, but they, they make a big difference. These are detailed things that I think people underthink or get frustrated when they say I have this like amazing piece and I can't figure out why it's not out there. Uh, it really sometimes does come to come down to the comment that was made earlier. You have a second to grab their attention. So really think about is it written well on social and in that line and that headline you gave them? Does it have a great image behind it? And then most important is the content once they get there actually compelling is it going to hold them because i totally agree it can be long or short does not even matter it has to be compelling content interesting and something that maybe they haven't seen before or haven't thought of in that way and if i could just interject very quickly that's a, such a smart point we do real-time headline testing and again not clickbait but alternative ways to connect people during the Ryder cup that just uh, finished a couple of weeks ago between the us and europe and golf we uh, headline tested 50 different 50 stories 44 of the times uh, of those 50 stories the alternative headline did better traffic so it is about experimenting and literally trying to give uh, users different doorways into the content great point was um, you're, you're, you consult the politicians no no organizations organizations I don't do candidate okay. anymore <laughs> okay but you have I have okay a long time ago I don't, what's still, I just <laughs> You're distancing yourself from politics. <laughs> really trying to oh, yeah. push that away. 
<laughs> that was the first time I retired. <laughs> <laughs> I want to how, how does a politician a, um, get their story out there and, 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 and attract attention? In their yeah. Life? So that is probably the biggest change in our world. Um, and Vanda High and I can go back and forth with this. So just for full record. Vanda High was the sports editor at the AT when I was the editor in chief. <laughs> and I paid him 35 bucks a week. So just full disclosure. Um, and I had a sign above my desk that said PR equals BS. Um, and, he, and he said, no, just you'll like this. He said, you're going to be the first sellout of all of us. So um, he was right. Um, so, you know, it's changed. I mean, so the world, the world of politics has changed so much that we could not even, we could do a whole session on it. I think the biggest piece that I would say is that it's now much more about leading the story as much as they can rather than response. And um, I've been a big believer in, so I've handled gubernatorial indictments as the PR consultant. I've handled um, global lion, lion killings um, as a consultant, um, State of the Unions, et cetera. And the ability to put crumbs out there that you want people to go get rather than figure out what you're going to do once the story's out is probably the biggest shift. And this is not meant to be in any way a partisan comment because I don't care anymore. That's the greatest part about this new role. Um, it, who wins and who loses is the thing I took from journalism was making people respond to the story or getting the audience into the story rather than responding to the story which was kind of the way PR was taught. You could lead it, but what was your response? And I would say that love it, hate it, despise it, whatever. The president's Twitter is ult the ultimate practice of making everyone else respond to you rather than you respond to them. And that's what I would say about politics or frankly, any sort of strategic communication that you take. Let's go to I want to leave a, a few minutes for um, um, the, the Q and A, but I do want to ask you this: because of the digital storytelling, where you guys are, um, you know, looking at the numbers, you're looking at the clicks, you're looking at, um, are you finding that you are? The, I hate the word content. I'm going to tell you right off the bat. I, I, you know, I, I'm still a believer in word stories. Like you know, reporters write stories, writers write stories, but. Do you find that because of the response, the feedback you're getting from the audience, that you are dropping certain stories in favor of other stories, even though the story that you're dropping is a good story? I think it's your turn to that. Well, so my perspective might be a little different because Discover Wisconsin is essentially a pay for play. I get paid by clients to market um, their destination or their company and do it in a way that um, is interesting and hopefully interesting. Um, so I don't drop a story unless I don't get paid. <laughs> like if, or if I don't get paid, then I'll drop the story. So I'm, I, I'm in a little bit of a different boat. Um, but I mean, I do think, I don't know, on the, on the, it kind of leads to the branded content side. That's essentially what Discover Wisconsin is, is it's branded content. That's what they've been doing for 31 years. Um, and there, that word this is a little off. This is a little bit off of what you're asking, but that word is kind of seems to be a tainted word in the world of content. Um, but I think if you know if you can create content that is um, paid for and actually interesting to your to your audience, that's gonna keep me my job. That's kind of what a lot of it is about. So I'm not really quite on the journalism side. Um, I can't answer that as honestly, but I think it's a great question. And I think there's always a way, in my opinion, if it's an important story, I think there's always an angle or a way to tell it in a way that is going to engage your audience. You just haven't kind of figured it out quite yet. You know, test, test the next version of the version after that. I think, I think it's interesting, and you had kind of mentioned this in the email. So I think it goes a little different. And this is probably more about storytelling. So... Anyone in this room, first of all, none of us are normal because we're having a conversation about storytelling. Okay, so we're not normal when it comes to discussing storytelling because we actually think about it. But what I've learned is that what the digital world um, and the content world has done is everybody thinks or is told they have to tell a story. And it's not easy. 
and it's not easy to find stories or tell them or get people to tell them. And so I think that's the place where do we drop stuff or do we put stuff first um, or put some things in certain areas to get clicks? Um, I would put it this way. If you work really hard to try to tell a story you deserve that deserves to be told and it's really hard to still get it out, yeah, you got to give up on it sooner or later because there's just not that much time and energy anymore. And that's what we've found. Now, in the last 24 hours, um, we, be, we came under fire. There's political scandal in Minnesota. We came under fire as we've been the leading source of kind of laying crumbs out there as people followed it. Ultimately, the, the, a big part of the story came out on Wednesday. And we had nothing in Tuesday's newsletter about that story. And literally social lit up and ripped us for leading people down this road. And then when the story came out, we had nothing. And the fact of the matter was the person who's on the ballot was not mentioned in the divorce documents the way they were supposed to, but in fact, his former spouse was. And so we said, it's no longer about the candidate, it's now about his ex-wife, and we're done. But people expected us to still dig in. And so I subconsciously dropped the story and still got blowback. So people are watching to see if you drop stuff or put stuff in certain places. I would just say quickly from ESPN perspective, it, it has evolved. I think more than a conscious decision to do this or do that. It's an evolution. Um, our focus, because we have so much consumable content, um, that I'm going to actually call it content because it's data. It's live scores. It's it's box scores. It is real time commentary, ball by ball, pitch by pitch coverage of events. It's breaking news that is happening across not just U.S. sport but a panoply of international sport on a daily basis. We have tons of volume. And we have significant scale in terms of reaching an audience of up to 150 million users on a, a digital basis a month. So our focus is not on, we know we're going to get people in to consume that content, right? The question is, what can we add for flavor and spice to that? So our focus has been on quality over quantity. And when it comes to enterprise, investigative, and, and impactful storytelling, I think we are... And, are, I don't think we are. I know we are as invested or more invested in enterprise storytelling than any sports entity in the world. But it's uh, not about volume because you're still fighting for space here against the box score and the news and the quick analysis and the funny, you know, slam dunk video um, that all is people consume and are interested in all of that. So we're picking our spots and saying this is where we're going to invest in important or impactful or compelling uh, storytelling. Uh, one of my former bosses used to say that our goal as storytellers at ESPN is, is to surprise, delight, and engage. So when we look at the way we, we invest our storytelling resources, it's around that. Are you going to get a story you had no idea you're going to um, see or even know you'd be interested in it? Are you going to be delighted when you consume it and want to therefore share and tell people about it? And are you engaged so that you want to spend the time necessary to actually invest in that video or that long read or that podcast or whatever the content might be? I don't say we get it right 100% of the time, but that's sort of our overwhelming philosophy or overriding philosophy. And I think it serves us well. Okay, I'm gonna, we have a few minutes left. Um, are there any questions from anyone? Anyone? Nada. Okay. okay. Nobody does. That's a secret. <laughs> she, she's here. Uh -huh. What happens in Oshkosh stays in Oshkosh. <laughs> How do we get away with it? <laughs> so <laughs> I want to work on what you frame. That's things. not exactly <laughs> that. Well, I, I will say I I have a very different um, philosophy than my CEO and our managers who've been around for thirty years. They've been keeping it a secret for a long time. When I'm at a premiere party, I'm actually very upfront about it because I'm proud of the fact that we're not PBS. I love PBS. I watch that programming, but people assume we're PBS. We're a privately held company that gets 
paid via you know a lot of organizations and chambers of commerce. I think it's ma I think it's an extremely creative business concept that was uh, concocted back in 1986. Um, we own or we buy a half hour of airtime every single week. That's an infomercial slot. So most of the station, I think they're all supposed to. I don't know whether all of them do or not. They say something along the lines of the next half hour is paid programming brought to you by Discover Media Works. But yeah, you're not alone in that. Most people don't really know that it is. I always say the show has been branded content since 1986. It was branded content before people knew what branded content even was. Um, and yeah, everything we put out there, whether it's an interview I'm doing with Charlie Behrens at Ale Asylum or um, a piece on the University of Wisconsin Alumni Foundation, those are all being paid for. Um, and I mean, there that's a wishy-washy thing right now. There's not really a lot of hard and fast rules in terms of, in most cases, in terms of how to disclose that. Like I work with Chevrolet and they have their own corporate rules in terms of, oh, you have to put sponsored. Another client says you have to put in ad. Well, there's not like, from what I can tell, there's no legal, there's not a lot of fine print. It's still an area that people are trying to figure out what do we do here? So I'm just kind of waiting to see how things kind of shake out and pay attention to that conversation. You know, we get approached to do branded content across the ESPN platforms all the time, particularly in digital. And we have engaged in it at times, but to the point, it's, it's separate from our editorial organization. It's clearly uh, delineated and noted and transparent what it is. And, you know, we really like to, in those circumstances, um, offer content that's impactful and important, right? It's, it's, Branded content in and of itself, in my opinion, doesn't necessarily taint uh, the the storytelling or the, or the content. It depends on what approach you bring to it. And if you're transparent with, with an audience, I think they can make that, that delineation. If the facts get skewed as a result of uh, sponsorship or the uh, agenda of, of whoever's creating the content, that becomes a different conversation. But in and of itself, um, I think it, it can actually be uh, just another element of content that people are, are willing to consume. Do, do, do your clients or your sponsors see the story before it airs or before mm -hmm. the in, in, in our circumstance, uh, it's handled completely separate from our editorial department. And so, yes, there would be, but it, it is, again, um, you know, fully and consistently transparently branded as being, mm -hmm. you know, sponsored content. Transparency is the key. I mean, we sell sponsored links of content. Um, and even the audience, I mean, it literally can be running for four weeks in a row. And somebody goes, why do you keep running that story? <laughs> and it says literally in all caps right. and bold, sponsored. Right. <laughs> and you're like, you know, that's how you get, we get paid. <laughs> and literally, so it works, it too. I mean, that's the other thing about it is, mm -hmm. um, it works. Does the heckler get money? Depends on the day. <laughs> uh, I joke that my full-time job pays the bills and the heckler makes the bills. I mean, <laughs> like I said, it's very much a passion project. There have been times where we've had like nice runs of success and others where, you know, it's a hobby. Any other questions? Yes. How much focus does Discovery Media Works have on Well, I mean, the, the obvious answer is that there is no brand, there is no company without the people, right? And especially in journalism, especially in sports journalism, where, again, you're trying to cut through the clutter of a lot of different voices. Well, what ESPN has long had a legacy of and continues to this day is having personalities that cut through. And there are other media, sports media companies that also have personalities that cut through. I, I fully acknowledge that. But, you know, sort of the the defining moment of, of ESPN was the growth of Sports Center. When Sports Center grew out into the 80s, into the 90s, was these huge personalities, the Keith Obermans and the Dan Patricks and the Stuart Scotts, that are people that have really redefined what sports journalism is um, and it, forever. Um, and we continue to have 
on our air, on our, on our digital platforms, on our audio sites, in the magazine. Incredibly talented individuals behind all of that. Some of them need editors, and uh, it's good to know because that keeps me in business. Um, but, you know, it's ultimately the strength of our storytellers that make the difference and the voice they bring. You may like Stephen A. Smith, you may not like Stephen A. Smith, but there's no de denying you're going to listen to Stephen A. Smith because um, you can't help it. Um, and I say that in a good way as a friend of Stephen's. Um, at the same time, though, you know, we, we remind everybody all the time, the four letters that matter are ESPN. Like that is why people come to us. It's not the individuals, it's the collection of individuals that make up the brand and the storytelling and the experience you're gonna get across our platforms. And we, you know, uh, Sarah knows this very well. Um, you know, uh, all of our talent know that when you're, rep when you're on Twitter, you know, you are no longer yourself. You are yourself, but you are ESPN's yourself. Um, whenever, if there's controversy, anybody says anything about it, people don't say, well, that was Adam Schefter or that was Stephen A. Smith. Um, uh, that was ESPN's Adam Schefter, ESPN's Stephen A. Smith. So there is a constant pro and con to that, right? There's a huge opportunity for us to say it makes us stronger because we've got great people that, uh, that fans want to pay attention to. Um, but we also have to note that there's responsibility that comes with that role because no, people no longer make the separation between you as an individual and you as an employee or a contributor to ESPN. So it's a it's a day to day, um, you know, conversation we have. But at the end of the day, what makes us great is the, is the voices and the talent that we bring to bear. That's why people come to us. I just add something for those of you sitting out there thinking about it in this way and I'll use Olbermann as an example. Um, and we've seen this, I've seen this. So I, I grew up in a suburb of Minneapolis, came to Oshkosh, went back, did politics. Never in my life was agriculture a part of my work. But we noticed through data and clicks in our publications that ag stories and ag insights were getting a lot of coverage. We now publish an ag newsletter that has my name on it. And it's because our audience trusts that I've gleaned <laughs> stuff from there. And with Oberman, yeah. he cut his teeth yeah. on sports. But as he built his audience on politics, trust him or not, um, it was that they trusted him and they liked his personality. Right. And so that's where the, I'd say the personality comes into. It is about the, the umbrella brand, but you as individuals cultivating that audience and feeding them. You can diversify. Agreed. All right. You know what? You are gone. So thank you very much, panelists. Thank you. So um, thank you very much. I think you guys have another question. Yep, we have another question in this room. And if anybody, I think we're willing to hang out in the hall yeah. here a bit if anybody wants yeah. to follow up. So. <laughs>